welcome. This is the Keeping Your Business Alive During COVID-19 webinar series. And we have an extraordinary guest today, Rosemary Ravenall. She's gonna be talking about crisis conversations for business leaders during COVID-19. And we'll talk a little bit more about Rosemary's amazing background here in a second. I wanted to also tell you, we have an amazing lineup coming up. Uh, we have Alex de Carvalho, formerly of IBM and Constant Contact. He's gonna be talking about the Small Business Marketing Playbook. Alex is also a lead instructor uh, of uh, BizHacks courses. And we have a very exciting announcement, uh, a new offering that Alex and I are gonna be uh, announcing for the first time publicly today. So stick around to the end and we'll share with you more about that very soon. The following Wednesday, we have Abdul Mohammed. Uh, he's a 20 year digital agency veteran. He's worked at Zimmerman. He was the former chief digital officer of RBB Communications. That's two weeks from today. And he's gonna be talking about brand love essentials. Uh, this is one of the most important topics. This is not a soft or feel goody topic at all. Right now is the moment when you need to be establishing customer loyalty and helping in whatever way you can because the second things start to loosen up, they're gonna come to the people who were there in a time of need. And so brand love, uh, feeling affection towards a brand and loyalty towards the brand is really the number one job of any marketer right now. Um, after that, you know, video is king and we have an expert in social media video giving his ad tips and tricks on Thursday, May 7th. We're doing that in partnership with Venture Cafe Miami, hence the slight change in time. It's a Thursday at 6 p.m. So I uh, really am excited for that uh, lineup of incredible talent that we have coming up. And uh, for those of you who are just joining, I wanted to encourage you to please um, share this link um, uh, uh, share your posts at ha the hashtag BizHack. Follow us on social media at BizHack Academy. And if you haven't yet, please take our business climate survey. I just shared the link in the chat. Uh, the chat is also where you can ask any questions and we're gonna have uh, two Q&A sessions uh, for Rosemary where you can talk uh, directly to her and get your crisis communications questions answered. For those of you who are new to BizHack and have never attended one of these webinars, I just wanted to do a quick introduction. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the founder of BizHack. BizHack is an advanced digital marketing training academy. We primarily focus on businesses and mid-career marketers and communications professionals and getting them leveled up. I am actually a journalist by training who turned into a marketer and educator. Uh, I worked for some of the top broadcast and uh, newspaper companies in the country. And I was actually lucky enough to be a part of a Pulitzer Prize early in my career for the coverage of the Elian Gonzalez um, raid. I've headed up marketing and PR at both two software startups and a billion dollar energy company. So I have the perspective of both the corporate and the small business. I am self, myself the owner of a small business and uh, understand how to bootstrap your marketing with small budgets and no staff. And uh, I'm an alumnus of Princeton undergrad and uh, FIU graduate school, go Panthers. Um, I think uh, Rosemary, you're a graduate of FIU as well. So uh, that was a nice surprise. Um, you know, BizHack with this webinar series and with all the work we do, we are really trying to embed ourselves as a critical part of the business ecosystem. Miami is known as a startup city, but not a scale up city. Businesses have a lot of trouble growing in this market. And so we've partnered with the top universities in town to provide cutting edge, hands-on knowledge and training to help with marketing, which is really about how you scale your company. And we've worked with some of the top businesses in Miami and beyond to help them scale their businesses and upskill their marketing and, and communications folks. And uh, we were recognized for this work in 2019 in the Miami Herald Startup Pitch Competition as one of the top startups in Miami. And we were also part of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Accelerator Program. The way we measure our impact is do our businesses that run through our programs make more money through online lead generation? And you can see that in 2019, the collectively those businesses spent $17,000 running ads 
and made more than half a million dollars in incremental revenue because of those ads. That is the number I am most proud of because it is the number, uh, uh, the bottom line number of how the kind of impact that we're making for hundreds of small businesses in this community. So enough about BizHack and on to our featured guest today, Rosemary Ravenall, who's gonna be talking about crisis conversations. You're gonna get three takeaways from her presentation. You're gonna learn about the fundamentals of crisis communications. You're gonna learn the rules of engagement during a pandemic like this about how to communicate with your staff and with your customers effectively. And you're gonna get a 10 point checklist, which will be sitting in your inbox um, about how to reach uh, the other end of this crisis with your reputation intact. And I would say enhanced. If you follow Rosemary's guidance, you will create brand love and you will ha come out of this crisis with a stronger brand than you came into it with. Rosemary's also gonna give you some do's and don'ts using examples of companies and how they're communicating during this crisis. Rosemary is a communications coach for executives and she is also a public speaker. She is an expert in how to tell stories for business and she's done this kind of work at some of the top corporations in the country, both as a staff and uh, as one of her clients. She has held um, senior public relations uh, positions and she has a particular expertise in the Hispanic market, having worked at Univision and also the Latin American market. So if you have any questions about Hispanic or Latin American marketing and communications and how it is uh, that is an area of her deep expertise. She was also the past president of the Hispanic Public Relations uh, Association. She's been an analyst at MSB, NBC and local public affairs shows. And as I mentioned, uh, was an undergraduate at Adelphi and had her master's uh, at FIU. Um, so without further ado, I want to uh, hand it over to Rosemary, uh, my dear friend, uh, a BizHack program alumnus, recently minted and uh, an extraordinary communicator. Wonderful. Thank you for the kind introduction. And it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces. Good afternoon. Let me share my screen with you. So we're gonna talk about crisis conversations, not crisis communication exactly, okay? Because this is about a two-way interaction. And I wanna encourage that this is not something you do by yourself. This is something that's a process, a community process. So it's, it's, it's using the power of your voice, but your voice as it's amplified and echoed in your interactions with others. So we're gonna go through the first part of, of this as principles, as just sort of like the macro view, because every organization will be at the receiving end of an event that risks reputational damage. Any organization, a nonprofit, a small mom and pop, and uh, a solopreneur, everyone is at risk even in family, in social relationships, this is something that comes with being alive. When bad things happen, it's what you do next that counts. Because after all, this is about decisions. It's about what you choose to do when something bad happens. Now, it could happen, any of these scenarios that are pictured here could happen. You could have a restaurant that there could be an E. coli uh, uh, outbreak that can ruin your reputation. Nobody wants to eat at your restaurant. You might own a company that does deliveries and your driver may have a hit and run with someone and you have the liability. You may need to downsize and fire a number of people and that's certainly not something companies like to do. Or you may have uh, an unexpected fire or flood in the building that you occupy. All these things will have a direct impact on what you do and how you do it. I wanna look at this example with you as sort of the epitome of the master of crisis communication. He's been on the, on the cover of Fortune magazine. He's no longer, unfortunately, the CEO of American Express, but he has been coined by the business world and Harvard in particular as sort of the, the master of, of, of crisis, the, the CEO, the, the crisis CEO, because he handled so many things correctly. And he coined certain terms that stay with us to this day, which is we have to remember that reputations are won and lost in a crisis. And that couldn't be more true. And it's better to, to, to take charge than having to ask for forgiveness. So it's basically he's saying you have to be accountable, you have to act quickly, and you have to own it. 
the origin of, of the word, I know that some people look at the Chinese uh, term, but crisis actually is is uh, is spawned from the Greek tragedies. It's it's a uh, it's a word that that means in Greek sort of a moment of decision. You know that that pivot point, that 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 moment when you have to make a critical choice that can make or break something. You know, it's uh, Sophocles wrote most of his uh, tragedies around this the sense of crisis. Oedipus Rex is one one a colorful example. Of course, we know someone who killed the king who was his father, married his mother, and then when he found out what he'd done, he gouged his eyes out. Obviously, that's a Greek tragedy for you. But that's, um, that's, that's the origin of the word. Let's take a look at companies that have chosen, that have made that, that taken that pivot point correctly, for, I'm sorry, incorrectly. Then we're going to talk about those that have done it correctly. These are all examples that you might remember. They're fairly recent. Uh, in 2017, there was an Asian American passenger who was caught on video being dragged off a plane, United Airlines plane, bleeding from his face. Uh, he had um, refused to, uh, to, to deplane because the, the flight attendants were asking him to uh, surrender his seat because the flight was overbooked and he pr protested. Well, unfortunately, this made national world headlines. The response from Oscar Munoz, the CEO, was that the passenger was disruptive, that he was belligerent, that he gave us a hard time and sort of like it was like his fault, he deserved it. Obviously then in, in terms of the, uh, the uh, Wall Street response was the stock lost more than 800 million in just one hour. Let's take a look in, in a real uh, E. coli outbreak with Chipotle you know, back uh, in 2015 and then it lasted about five more years. They had major safety problems and they were plaguing them. Uh, it was made worse by the CEO in public making jokes about the situation, about people having bad digestion, blaming the news media for making a sensation out of the story. Well, unfortunately, it cost an 82% decrease in profits and the stock dropped by 15%. Uber has had its share of crises. This one, uh, they, they actually handle a little bit better than most. In 2017, there were uh, drivers that were complaining because of discrimination, of inadequate compensation, and many other uh, grievances. The CEO at the time was Travis Kalanick, and he basically just dismissed it, saying that these were just people exaggerating, that we were doing everything right. They refused to take action. Well, 200,000 customers said, you know, we don't like this Uber. We're, we're going elsewhere. We're going over, you know, to Lyft or, or another service. He had to resign. So these are all vivid examples that have lessons for all of us. Let's take a look at the mother load of mismanaged crises. Uh, this is one that is in just about every crisis communication handbook. It's in just about every business management text, which is the, the BP handling of the uh, of the worst oil spill in history, which was the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. It was the, uh, the rig exploding 2010, 11 workers were killed. Tons and tons of gallons, uh, gallons of, uh, of, of oil were, were just poured into the Gulf of Mexico. Methane gas was all over. There was a huge environmental damage to the marine life and bird life. BP was the company in charge, British Petroleum. And they were blamed, uh, or just sort of summarily, uh, for the worst environmental disaster in history. They brought on the crisis more so because their CEO, Tony Hayward, Tony Hayward, was the face of the company and he took his sweet time coming from London to New Orleans to deal with the situation. And then when he arrived, he just made himself scarce. He just didn't want to deal with the, uh, with the public or with the media. He diminished the impact saying the Gulf of Mexico is a big ocean. So what's the big deal? He blamed the rig owners for the problem and on and on and on. And then he was very famously quoted as saying, I want my life back. And then a subsequent lukewarm apology. He showed little concern, serious lack of organization, didn't own the situation. Well, it cost BP more than $62 billion in fines and the cleanup costs and the stock took a nosedive. So with that as sort of the poster child for what not to do, Let's take a look at some companies that have done it right. Starbucks a few years ago in Philadelphia had a situation where the store manager misidentified two black gentlemen who were in the store. He accused them of loitering and trespassing. He called the police. Well, that was caught on video. And 
sparked, sparked tremendous protests. Uh, the CEO acted quickly and you know, took responsibility, said we're going to do things differently. And the company was praised for their action. Facebook similarly had a, a huge data breach and they've had many, many crises. This one had to do with the Trump uh, election campaign. Cambridge Analytica, well, Zuckerberg put his persona into, into the picture. He apologized to Congress and you see him having a very, very warm and uh, amicable handshake with a member of the Congressional Committee. I'm gonna go quickly through three more slides because this one's important. This is the very platform that we're using. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's actually the picture is, is worth a thousand words because as we all know, there's been Zoom bombing, there's been security breaches. Basically Zoom since the uh, pandemic has had a crisis every day. So what happens? The CEO and founder Eric Yuan says, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to, I'm going to show my face. I'm going to apologize. I'm going to show we care. I mean, what a better virtual background than this one with the heart and we care. We care about all of you. But he did say, we made a mistake. You know, we fell short, but we took action quickly. We learned our lessons and we're stepping back and fixing it because he said that with popularity comes responsibility, right? Another wonderful example. Juan Andres, he's a very successful restaurateur, a culinary icon. He puts his, his time into feeding people. He feeds people in fancy restaurants, but he also feeds the poor and the needy and people who are in crisis situations as a result of hurricanes. He's doing it now with healthcare workers. He has made a tremendous, tremendous bounty of trust because he has addressed what matters most, okay? And he has put his values into action. Another great example, I love to see this photo, you know, during, during many of the, this is in particular during Hurricane Sandy, everyone expects leaders to care, you know, to show empathy, to, to express that I feel your pain and to be truthful about it and to have actions that match their words consistently over time. And again, that match the values. And this is really important because we saw it in, in the case of, um, of BP, silence isn't golden. You know, it's seen as an as admission of guilt. If you're late to the game, if, if you show basically that you have nothing to say, people will say it for you. You have to acknowledge the problem and take responsibility quickly. And speaking of quickly, there's something called, you know, the first move advantage. You know, the first out of the gate controls the narrative. Uh, if you don't do it, your competitors and critics will do it for you. You know, uh, news hates a vacuum. Somebody will always create it if you don't create it yourself. There's something called the golden hour of crisis response, which is a medical term, which means that after a traumatic event, you know, that medical attention that a patient needs to stay alive has to be done during that golden hour of crisis. Right. And you have to show you care in, in, you know, in the first hour, and there's at most a three-day window. Um, and that is, that is basically what I want to share. Let me give you some, some, uh, some summaries before we get into the question and answer. So in summary, make, make the right decision. After all, crisis is an, op is, is an opportunity. It's an opportunity if you make the right decision. So act quickly, acknowledge there's a problem, show you care. It's okay to say you don't know, stick by your values. You see, you see the summary here. I'm going to leave this up while I entertain questions from all of you. Perfect, thank you. Um, Rosanna de Guzman uh, asked, how do you feel the COVID-19 crisis is being handled so far? Um, and uh, Rosanna, if you wanted to um, unmute yourself, uh, it's a broad question. I don't know if you wanted to talk about it from a political perspective or from a specific industry business perspective, because the, the, the answer I think would change depending on that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested um, from the government perspective, and if there's time, maybe a little bit on the medical side, but, mm -hmm. but more from the organizational, the government as an organization, the planning, the strategy, all of that, and the response, yes. Well, that's, that's a loaded question. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to go into some COVID-specific actions in the second part of my of my my time with you, but it just just to summarize, and I think I'm not saying anything that is politically uh, uh, motivated. I think it's something that's that's been very well documented by 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 experts as well as the media that there is no plan. The response has been dismal. This this has been a debacle and continues to be a debacle because there's no leadership, and all these things that I have on the screen. 
there's no, they didn't act quickly. They didn't acknowledge, and I'm saying they, meaning the administration, there was no acknowledgement of the problem. There was lack of empathy in showing that they cared. There, there, there was no honesty and very little humility, okay? Um, they always know the answer. If they know the answer, they never say that they don't know. There's been inconsistency. Every White House uh, um, coronavirus briefing has been different in its tone, in its information. It's been disparity after disparity. Communication has been muddled. There's very little trust. That's why the governors are taking over actions that impact their immediate states. There's been blame. Yesterday, there was a blame to the World Health Organization saying, we're going to defund you because you're to blame for this. Okay. And uh, well, I, I could go on and on, but I think that actually it's, it's very timely that I'm sharing the screen with you because I, I believe that this answers your question. And Rosemary, you also did something interesting on your blog, which you analyzed um, just uh, Trump's um, <laughs> daily yeah. briefings. Um, yeah. And um, this is a, a chance for you to talk about the amazing blog that you, you, you do put out and, and what you right. found. Right. And rosemaryravenel.com. I, I love to write blogs that are about not only uh, things that should be done well, sort of tips and tricks that are based on my, my expertise, but I like to also be an observer of current events. And I happened on, on an article that uh, talked about the, uh, the, the live sports betting uh, industry is pretty much frozen because there are no live sports events to bet on. So they started something that bets on, takes bets on how many times Trump during his White House coronavirus briefings will say certain words that are part of his lexicon. Words like uh, immense, like fantastic, like very, very, great, great, the best, terrific. These are all words that if you listen carefully, he will repeat incessantly. And so people are actually making money, I hope, uh, betting on how many times Trump will utter those words at a given time. And, and actually what, what I mean in the, in the blog is that that's actually bad, bad public speaking, because when you're repeating these words that are basically empty, you're, you're overstating things and you're exaggerating, you're actually diluting what you're saying, which basically means that you didn't say very much at all. Um, we had uh, Dave Bricker ask, if you're the captain, everything that happens on your ship is your fault, no matter who screwed it up. Great point. Amanda Elam uh, uh, asks, how can small businesses adapt communications to avoid being tone deaf? How can we engage our customers without necessarily trying to sell to buyers who have no money or other constraints? I'm going to be talking about that during the second part of our time together. Perfect. So I think if you can hold that question and please come back with your question if the if the content did not answer your question. Yeah, and Amanda, it's great to have you on the on. Thank you so much. She's with Babson College. Alex asked, how can restaurants respond and communicate during this quarantine beyond offering home delivery? Great question, Alex. Right. I have some examples of that as well. And, uh, and, and I think that actually the second part, I would like very much to be a discussion because obviously we are, we are in a situation that is unprecedented, unprecedented in every way. You know, when you look at, there's no, there's no playbook to fall back on. Now this is, this, the last time something of this global magnitude happened, it was 1918, which was the Spanish flu. And it took several years for it to finally dissipate in a vaccine to, to, be, uh, to be put to the public. But we have no point of reference. You know, uh, people who analyze crises are looking at, sorry, <laughs> um, are looking at 9/11 as the as the last major event. You know that that we can use as a point of reference. But that now pales by comparison to this one. So, and, and another thing that makes this this pan this coronavirus pandemic so significant for everybody is that. It's, not, it's a natural disaster. It's a natural phenomenon. We can't control it. There's no, this, there was no one person or one entity responsible except for this, 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 this virus. And whereas if you're looking at a crisis of one's making, where you, as people have control, like BP, somebody did something wrong, then you have a sense of more control. There's, there's more of a sense of, of being the captain of your ship and being able to steer it in, in, in the right direction. But this is, this is unknown, uncharted waters. So I think all businesses, all individuals, in terms of how they manage their lives, we're improvising a great deal at this point, which is why it's so important to learn from others and look at lessons from the past, lessons from every aspect of business and, and private life and even spiritual life 
to guide us in our next steps and the decisions we'll have to make going forward. Perfect. Um, let, let's go on now to some of the local examples and other, uh, the second half of your presentation. Sure. And guys, keep the questions coming, this is amazing. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pick those back up in a few minutes. Wonderful, okay. So let's put this in action, okay? So we're putting these success principles into, into practice. Um, so where do we start? Okay, so I just said that this was unprecedented. It's actually, you know, this is the, the, the first global pandemic of the digital age, right? And there are other, but there were other smaller. There was the, the H1N1, the swine flu, uh, there was Ebola. There were smaller uh, health crises. And some of the people who observe, study, and, 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 and teach about crisis communication have looked at some, some, some lessons, some best practices from those smaller pandemics. And uh, I'm going to show, share some of those with you. So what, what COVID-19 means right now, it's, it's human operational and economic, you know, disruption of every, in every form, right? We know it, we don't, and nobody has to tell us that. It, but it's not a marketing opportunity. It is not a marketing opportunity at all. It's an opportunity to gain trust and to strengthen your brand. Is this a mic that's open? I mean, I'm no, hearing something. I'll take care of that. Okay. The, okay, so this is, this is, I'm going to go through eight points that come from the, the pandemic communication playbook. Okay. And I thought that there, there are many others, but I thought that these would be relevant to our, our, our talk today. Enlist employees. And I could substitute the word employees for staff, for, for colleagues, for, for uh, anyone who is in your sphere of influence, right? Uh, be honest, ask for their ideas, you know, create a team, don't go it alone. You know, uh, you know to, to, to go to, to Dave's uh, analogy of, of, of the captain of the ship, you need, a, you need a crew, you need a good crew and the crew all, they have to follow your instructions and know why. You know, meet and talk daily, establish a war room. You could have a place in your home office where you have information, where you're, you're chronicling how things are going, where you might keep some resources that are not necessarily digital, but where you, com you, you collect information. Uh, maybe, maybe it's instead of a war room, it's, say, it's a shared drive, where you, you post information to be shared with others that are part of your team. But what's important is that even if you share the spokesperson task with others, you speak with one voice. It has to be one voice, even if it comes from different people. This quote here from Mark Cuban, who's weighed in on this issue, and he says, be honest with your employees. Let them know what you know. Put yourself in their shoes and ask what they suggest, because that's where your best ideas will come from. Number two, make people first. Put people first. Stay connected with your customers. Stay connected in every way possible. Maintain dialogue. And dialogue means two ways, it's a conversation in every way possible, consistently. Talk about people, about them, before you talk about you, right? How are they suffering? How are they responding? How are their lives disrupted? Be transparent and truthful, meaning that if, for example, you had someone uh, in your restaurant staff test positive for COVID-19, you say it. But then at the same time, you say, what are you doing about it? And what are you going to do to make sure that your customers are going to be safe, right? And it's okay to say you don't know because there's so much that's going on that affects us that we don't know. Monitor and update in real time. Now this is one where we really have to be vigilant because there's new guidelines that happen every day by the minute and there's credible sources and then there's speculation. There's so much that's out there that is unfounded that people do pay attention to unfortunately. Pay, you know, find the credible sources and listen to local officials. As we know, those of us who live in South Florida, there's there's city of Miami Beach uh, regulations and the city of Miami, and then I live in Doral, they have separate. Not, there's no real uniform set of guidelines and curfews, so you have to really stay informed of how these affect what communities and uh, how they're changing. And stay on top of what other companies are doing. You know, monitor, do, do some alerts, monitor social. What are other companies who basically are standard bearers? What are they doing that you can replicate? But stay in your lane. So if you're a baker, a bakery, don't start commenting on the shoe repeat up down, down the street. You know, stay in what you know. Talk about what you know, what your expertise is. And adapt your actions in keeping with your values. You know, if, if, if you sell, if you sell cakes, you know, you're not going to, are you going to want to sell, give a toilet, a roll of toilet paper with every purchase? I don't know. 
it doesn't necessarily, it may meet your values, but it may not. I'm using that as, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an extreme example, but I wouldn't put it past some companies to be doing it or thinking about it. Come together with your competitors. Now, this is sort of a real think, thinking out of the box kind of ideas. If your industry is hit particularly hard by the impact of coronavirus, now's not the time to double down on trying to compete. Now's the time when you can, all bakers could come together, all, um, all, all yoga studios could come together and do something in, in concert, you know, uh, restaurants coming together. We see a lot of that uh, is evidenced already in terms of how they're banding together to help uh, people who are, uh, you know, who have food sh shortages to help the elderly, et cetera, et cetera. It's in the news every day. So it's time to come together with competitors, brainstorm, create, get creative during this unprecedented time. Okay, plan for the long term, asterisk, even if you don't know what's coming. So develop content for what's down the road. Think about every piece of content, every, every tweet, every, every email. Think about, be thoughtful about how is this going to impact in the future? What can you repurpose? How can you build on that messaging platform? Think more long term. Imagine, reimagine what the future might bring and therefore set your sights on, on how your actions today will take you where you want to go. You know, document your actions. I think it's a fascinating time to, um, did I do that? To, um, to collect your, create sort of a, a catalog of, of what, you, what you did, what you, what you collected, information, so that then you can reflect back on it and say, well, this, did, this worked well, this didn't. Co collecting best practices, it will help you grow tremendously. Get feedback from all sources from family, from customers. I mean, there's people who are observing and, and want to comment, accept those comments as, as constructive criticism. So imagine the future, you know, what about, you know, take one dispensers for masks uh, for your bakery when you, when you open again? What about a temperature monitoring station at the entrance to your store? There's countless ways that you can reimagine what the future will bring. Communicate at least once a day in different platforms. The situation changes by the hour. You know, audit what you're saying. Are you being consistent in what you're saying? Uh, I've, I've been monitoring a lot of local businesses and they're not consistent. What appears in one particular platform is not echoed by another. Uh, use all your platforms, text, email, website, uh, maybe even call some customers, you know, call, have a voice call and say, how are you doing, loyal customer? I got a call the other day from the, the dog groomer. She said, how are you doing? How is your dog too? We're going to open up a certain number of hours for loyal customers. Would you like to come in? I was really impressed. I mean, they really won my loyalty for the long term. And then create a COVID-19 landing page, okay, so that you don't have to retool your entire website, but you can create a place where you're posting this, this current information as to what you're doing. Okay, don't make noise. You know, there's a lot of noise. Don't just put that stuff out there to stay active and to get your name out there. You know, what, what are you sharing that really addresses a need? Are you jumping on the bandwagon of opportunity because everybody else is doing it? Are you targeting the right people in the right language? And I put a call out box here because I think it's important. You see these terms used uh, sometimes interchangeably and sometimes incorrectly. So coronavirus is a term for the family of viruses, right? That, that, uh, that has spikes on their surfaces. You see it photographed with little red spikes, which are not really there. They're just there so you, they, the spikes can be highlighted. But it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the swine flu, it's, it's, it's H1N1, it's a series of, of, uh, of SARS viruses. COVID-19 is the specific disease produced by the new virus. And that new virus is called SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2. That's the name of the virus that's, that's causing us this pandemic. It's okay to use in, 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 uh, in text the, 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 the coronavirus pandemic or the novel coronavirus. You'll see uh, these, these references used a lot in news media reports. So it's important to use these terms correctly. No one has coronavirus. Someone ha might have the symptoms of COVID-19. Okay, hit the right tone and manner. Okay, match the moment. New people are hypersensitive right now. You have to be super respectful, you have to show compassion. And what's important in this slide is the we too ratio. This is a, a post from the uh, CEO of Grubhub. And I highlighted the times, the number of times that the word you is, 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 is used. And actually, if you count the we, I, us, is three times. So it's an eight to three ratio, which is great. So if you can safely continue your favorite restaurant, safety for you, it's important to look at what you write. 
a tweet, an Instagram, a, a Facebook post, an email. Think about you, not about we. Okay, Start, stop selling and start solving. Here's an example from the Schneebly Winery uh, here in Miami. They didn't do anything to their website, but they created was a landing page and they had these offers for these virtual wine tastings. I thought this was a little bit off tone because look at what they are their headline. It's virtual taste and it says, we found a way out of this house arrest. I'm sorry, but you know, staying, staying home and, and, and you know, sort of uh, sheltering in place is not a rest. You know, it's like a harsh word. It's a negative word. And then on another part of that page, they say wine can be the cure. Again, I just think it's like there is no cure for COVID-19. So it's, it's, to me, it was just insensitive. Uh, I, I found this grating when I, when I saw it. You may think differently. Pollo Tropical, which has 140 stores in South Florida, they have this, of course, they, they can, they sell you a raw chicken with all the adobo, but you can also pick up drive through free delivery. But then look at the, look at the, the, the fine print, valid through April 30th, only available at PolloTropical.com or my Pollo app. Like, do they think the pandemic will end in April? It's like, just again, it was a little off for me. This is a nice example. The Cow Bakery has multiple locations throughout Florida. They have a lovely Instagram page. They show what they're doing for the uh, uh, frontline workers. They have photos with, uh, with, with fire uh, firemen. They don't picture themselves in it. It's all about the people that they're serving, about people consuming their product. It's about doing some, giving something back, free Cuban, um, Cuban bread Mondays. And then the nice letter from the, from the CEO, you know, it's, it's as, as a community we are facing, you know, the, the, the use of the we, we are proud to, you know, it's, 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 it's more like we're, we're doing for you. It could use a better we, you ratio, but it still has a very strong sense of we're, we're here for you. And um, I just thought it was for a local company, it was a very, very nice example. One more example that, uh, two more examples actually. Uh, this is the Betsy Hotel, which is one of my favorite places uh, to enjoy good food, music, poetry, book readings. It's, it's a culture hotel, experiential culture. It's, it's on Ocean Drive. It's run by this, this family, this it's highly, highly philanthropic, the, the Pletznik, Pletznik family. And they, this is on their, their homepage, a note about how we move forward. I thought that was really elegant, how we move forward. And then what they're doing is they have these virtual events and they have poets and they have uh, special food offers. So they're touching every aspect of their business and every, every customer that engages with the Bessie brand. You know, I thought it was a tone of optimism, you know, how we move forward, just really creating an uplifting way to lead off the page with this hero photo. However, then talk about uh, opportunistic uh, companies. This was from uh, yesterday's Miami Herald. It's an ad and it says, company releases high potency CBD formula to help people sleep, relax, and stay comfortable during crisis. It's like, okay. It's, to me, it was really tone deaf. And this one from Ameritrade, you know, you know the feeling when you, you know, actually get up early to go to the gym. This was on the 11th. I'm sorry, people can't go to the gym. Okay, and investing right now and changing your investments is a really, really bad idea, right? Then lastly, um, I want to leave you with two of my favorite quotes that uh, I really think are guiding principles for me, and I think are guide, could be guiding principles for you as you develop your own uh, actions in response to uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic. You know, this, is a, this has been quoted openly, but I, I'd like to read it for you one more time. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And on a similar note, Warren Buffett says about reputations, it takes 20 years to build reputation and five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, keep that in mind, you would do things differently. So with that, I, I invite your questions, but I also want us at some point today, please pray for the families of the 2 million people around the world who have died and the 29,000 people in the US who have fallen to this disease. So with that, I love your questions. Uh, thank you. And, and uh, I love these quotes um, and I love the sentiment you just expressed. Let's revisit Amanda's um, question. How can small businesses adapt communications to avoid being tone deaf? Now we have a couple of examples of people who are a little tone deaf as well as other examples of folks who are doing a better job. 
And uh, by the way, uh, I wanted to invite you guys. Um, we had a great experience last week where people were sharing resources, uh, including their own businesses that specifically address the topic. So if you um, know of a good resource for crisis conversations and crisis communications, um, or if you yourself deal in that area, please go ahead and add that to the chat. We'll then um, copy those resources and share them uh, with our community next week when we send a, a summary of this. Um, and the other thing is if you know of any examples of local businesses mm -hmm. that are doing a really good job at this, uh, other examples, please throw their uh, information in. We'll give a shout out to folks who are really getting their tone right, because I think you learn a lot from good examples. Uh, as well as from bad. So uh, back to Amanda's question, how can small businesses adapt? How can we engage our customers without trying to sell to people who may not have money or other constraints? Right, well, I could go back to those slides, but in summary, uh, let, me, let me stop sharing uh, so I can see you. The, the principles are, are, are the same. I mean, what, what we just discussed, you know, really know what you're about, you know, know your, know your, your customers, know what, what they expect from you. Take a leadership role. Take a look at best practices. Take a look at who's doing what. Make sure that all your customer touch points are consistent. Take action. You can't just pretend it's not there. Acknowledge that during this time of disruption, we have had to limit our services, blah, blah, blah. However, give always and an, keep them engaged. Let them know what you're doing and thinking. Invite their ideas as to how you can continue to be of service to them during this time. Right? Don't just go into a cave and hide during this time and pretend that, well, when, when this is over, I'm going to resume everything that I was doing before. No, I think we all have to acknowledge that life and business will be different after we're, after, as, as, as we hope, there'll be an end to this, right? So all those, all those points, and really know what you're about. Look at, do an audit of every touch point for your brand. Every, every, every way that a, that, that a consumer or client can be in touch with you in whatever way you do business. And I think that's where it starts. And then what do you want to say? How do you want to serve? Right? Yeah. right? I think that's where it really starts. You know, I gave a tip a couple weeks ago, which is, you know, start where your customers are mm -hmm. and think from a, a term, think from a, from a, um, a perspective of how can you help. And if you come from that genuine place, um, and people feel that genuineness, the, the business sort of emerges from that. Um, you know, when I started this webinar series, I had no idea how much work it was gonna be. I had no idea whether it made sense business-wise. I just knew that I have a broadcast background and an amazing network of brilliant people, and I just needed to get them out in front of people because I needed it, because I knew we all need community and we need great, high-quality information. And so if if I could just solve that one little piece while we're all sorting this out, uh, I knew I was on the right track. And um, I invite each of us in our own ways, whether it's donating a portion of your proceeds, whether it's lending a little bit of your uh, special sauce, your expertise, the thing that makes you great, um, whatever you can do, I think right now, um, apart from like surviving and, and making money, which all of us need to do as well, and we shouldn't apologize for that, um, whatever you can do to provide and add value and help, I think this is the moment to do it and people will remember you for it. And if you do it in a spirit of service and out of a genuine place in your heart, and if you also do it in your lane, meaning if it's something that like makes sense, like for me to be talking about marketing during COVID-19 and to be hosting conversations similar to the ones I did when I was on the radio, that just makes a heck of a lot of sense for me. I don't have much money to donate. So maybe that's not the way I should give back. So the, 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 each of us have a different gift that we can give. And I think thinking deeply about how you can express that through service is the best marketing you can do. Stacy asked, good afternoon. Thank you for your presentation. How can we craft our communication online to increase sales and gain new customers as well if we're transitioning from totally being offline? So she's a company that was on, offline, that was like a traditional, mm -hmm. or retail, right. now she's going online, and how can she craft her communications to gain new customers and increase sales? Tell them what you offer. Tell them what you're doing. Tell them how you are giving them what they have enjoyed from you in a different way. But tell them, tell them again, and tell yeah. them consistently. 
and tell them with compassion, understanding their pain points. Make it easy for them to interact with you. Make it about them, right? Remember the you-we ratio? Yeah. So, so use careful, use your language carefully, but let people know because air, they, they can't, you know, some people don't even watch the news anymore and there are some of them are some people are just they, they don't want to be dealing with social media because it, it, everything is a reminder of what we're going through so find your own way of, of, of getting to them i have to tell you i used the example of the dog groomer i was so impressed with the fact that they called me and they told me that they were open for business be and they valued my business so much that they would be opening for me that meant a lot that meant yeah. a lot so you use that simple example and replicate that in, in your, through your own channels, I think you'll be surprised what a difference it can make. And, and Bruce Turkel, who was our guest two weeks ago, he wrote this book. It's called All About Them. Correct. He did not write it during this crisis. He wrote this long before this crisis. What we're talking about marketing during COVID-19 is actually just good marketing. Mm -hmm. don't like being sold to. Consumers are getting increasingly savvy and the hard sell just doesn't work as well as it used to if it ever really did. So I think that one of the messages here is if you can find a way to serve, not sell, as Rosemary so beautifully put it, not only is that a good practice now, and it also will help clarify things in terms of getting your tone right. Like if you're coming from a genuine place and not trying to hard sell, uh, and not letting anxiety and desperation, which many of us feel, uh, mm -hmm. leak into your communications. And that's where mindfulness, last week's topic comes up, is to mm -hmm. just sort of quiet yourself and then communicate. Um, I think you're in a better place. Rhonda asked, should companies communicate if an employee tests positive for coronavirus? Yes. Yes. I believe it's your responsibility to do so. If it's true, then you, you have a responsibility, inherent responsibility to communicate that accurately and quickly to everybody who could be impacted. But at the same time, communicate what you're going to do about it. Because you, now you have a responsibility. You have to protect the others. You have to protect yourself. So what measures are you taking? What guidelines are you following to ensure that this, that this will be handled correctly? If you, if you try to hide it, it's going to come back. I mean, it's, it's going to boomerang back at you with tremendous impact. You have to, there's no way to hide it. You have to just fess up, tell the truth, and tell it quickly, but at the same time, own it and act towards the best possible resolution. Um, Rosanna asked about the name of the blog mentioned at the very beginning. I think that's um, rosemaryravenel.com. Yes. Mm -hmm. You're also, that link is going to be in the presentation that um, Rosemary, that we're going to distribute after this. Uh, Janinia asked, she had a, a great kind of lead up, and then she asked, do you think from now on we'll be better prepared for a crisis and have ba a backup plan for communications? Ah, thank you, Janinia. Hi. Yes, but again, this is why I said chronicle what we're doing, keep records, document all your actions, because we forget so easily. <laughs> we as human beings forget so easily. That's why we repeat, history repeats itself so many times. Use this as a time to really, really get down, drill down to what works. What are, your, what are your guiding principles? Because those can be reapplied. What I shared with you comes from best practices of other situations that people and businesses have lived through. You know, we're not reinventing the wheel here, but, but what, what can be invented is what, how this is adapted for you. So take this as a time to really create your, your guidebook, you know, your manual. For the next time, maybe, maybe, you know, God willing, it'll be just a hurricane for us here, which we know of the drill, but it could be something else. We don't know. Again, because we don't know, that's where we need to be prepared to make those decisions based on what we know worked in the past. We have a few more minutes and, uh, you know, I've been trying to think, how can I get you guys a little more involved? We have 66 brilliant souls on this. I'd like each of you to take a minute and go into the chat and provide us your advice about how to communicate during this crisis. All of you have incredible wisdom and I don't wanna let this hour end without tapping into that wisdom. And please share with me, we'll use a selection of those on social media and in the wrap up email we send next week. But you know, I found myself compelled to just share how I am approaching it. Uh, and I feel a little bit of goosebumps because it really came from the heart but I know you guys have incredible things to say as well about how you're communicating with your employees, with your customers, with your family, with the world. Um, 
about how you're approaching this and we'll definitely share. Um, please have them coming on in. Um, we have a question while, while you guys are composing that. Um, we do have a question, a very interesting one from Vin Vedra. Um, he talked about uh, gaslighting, <laughs> which is uh, essentially, he read a post that has uh, lots of marketing that is attempting to make us feel like all is okay um, and almost sort of distracting us or confusing us from the reality. And uh, how do you feel about the pro marketing gaslighting? <laughs> it's going to backfire. It's going to backfire because this is now you can't put, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, for goodness sake. It's it's you know you can you, you it's 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 absurd because at the it it's going to backfire on you because this virus isn't just going to go away. Say okay, I've had enough fun. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to another another planet in the universe. It's here, and we it's our how we choose to deal with it. So the facts are the scientific facts are what they are. And each of us, we know, has a responsibility in terms of how we interact with other people. And each of our actions, like the tiny grains of sand, are collectively contributing to this resolution so we can go back to some kind of normalcy, right? So I think it's an absurd thing. I think whoever has been putting that out there is ridiculous. Uh, look at the example that I gave you of the Betsy Hotel, you know, on their website, top third, they say, how do we move forward together? Okay, so it's a sense of optimism, but it's not telling you something that, you know, it's not saying come here and you'll be cured, right? <laughs> come here and you'll be sheltered. No, it, they're saying we're offering you the experiences that we have cultivated, that we are known for, and we're giving them to you in a different way because we're part of the solution of how we can make this a better world in the future. Beautiful. You know, Rosemary, that would be a great place to end. But rather than that, I'm going to give you the hardest question I've gotten today because uh, I know you can do it. So my dear friend, Nisi Berryman, who runs Nisi B, it's a, a high-end high luxury design retailer in the design district. Um, she's having a challenge. She said, I love what the bakery's doing, but it's hard to imagine how to help, how that would help with my business. Uh, her business being um, she basically uh, primarily has a B2B business selling uh, mm -hmm. high-end furniture to interior decorators. Um, she also does some direct-to-consumer where she's selling high-end furniture, but it's a luxury business. It's a retail business. It's a tough business to be in right now. Uh, we all saw the retail numbers that came out this morning and the dramatic drop we saw. Mm -hmm. Any guidance or advice about crisis conversations uh, and d during a tough time like that for Nisi. And my heart goes out to you, Nisi. Yeah, Nisi. I'd love to talk to you offline because uh, we're actually Nisi and I are good friends. But in, is, as, as it benefits everybody on this, on this chat, uh, it, I think the examples are look at some of the other luxury brands. You know, how are they messaging out? You know, how is Louis Vuitton messaging out? How is an Hermes messaging out? Uh, I know that they're, they're the B2C, but what I'm saying is if it's a, if it's a luxury brand, there, there's your customers are still there, right? They haven't gone away, but how do you reach them, right? So the the transaction is still possible, but you have to get them the the the, the visuals of what it is that you're selling, what the new merchandise is, and and it, in some ways it, it it allows you to imagine how this will look in someone's home, uh, you know, how how this will complement the an, an ensemble uh, uh, in someone's living room better because you have more control over the virtual the virtual display of it but i'd say that nothing has really changed it's it's the 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 conduit that you use to get to the to the to the customer i hope that helps a little bit but i'd love to talk to you offline yeah nisi reach out to me as well i want to help um so guys i um i can't thank you enough uh it's amazing how quickly these hours go we have uh, and a couple important announcements uh, that I want to make as well as um, some community offers that are beginning to emerge from folks uh, who um, are here on the call. So first of all, I wanted to um, say that Rosemary has two gifts for you. Uh, she put together this beautiful one pager that you can print out and remind yourself each morning like a prayer. Uh, can communication tips for navigating a crisis? Uh, they're so useful. They're, they're simple seeming but profound and you can, everything you write, you can look at these tips and make sure that you're following them. She's also sending a copy of her really rich presentation. We have a link for that in the email that'll be following up after this. Um, those will be in your inbox shortly. We also have additional marketing resources in there, including we have put together uh, uh, an ongoing list of digital marketing resources for small businesses uh, during COVID-19. Uh, this is a list that includes 
um, free and uh, discount offers from digital marketing software companies like Facebook and Google, and we keep adding to it as new pro programs are announced. I think between Facebook and Google, they've pledged um, more than a billion dollars to help small businesses. Um, we, our community has been re responding as well. Uh, last week, I mentioned this. Not many of you have taken us up on this, so I wanted to bring it up again. Danny Sabai of Link to City, in partnership with Google, is offering three months of free SEO for your website. I at BizHack am taking him up on this. I have my meeting with him today to discuss. If you're interested to get started, go to BizHack at link to city twocity.com and uh, that link will also that email address will also be in the follow-up email it's completely free and no obligations it's funded by Google uh, link to city uh, agency is a Google partner Vera and Nancy are on the line and you guys please unmute yourselves you have launched an extraordinary uh, uh, volunteer effort for the hospitality industry called hospitality heroes um, TY Group and Harbor Linen is Vera and Nancy's company. And uh, I'll give it to you guys. Just let me know when you want me to advance the slide. Okay. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. And uh, thank you, Dan. So TY Group and Harbor Linen, we are a distributor in the hospitality industry. And we are part of Bed Bath & Beyond. Uh, we sell sheets, towels, robes, amenities to primarily hotels, cruise lines, and casinos. And about 20% of our business, we sell sheets, terry, and products of this nature to healthcare industry. And of course, we have been affected severely. Our business has been affected as our customers are, are suffering. So we've been thinking how we could help. And the first idea was for us to do something as a company, but we really wanted to engage our customers. And so we came up with Hospitality Heroes. And so our idea is to mobilize uh, teamwork within the hospitality industry to support the recommendation of universal uh, mask wear, um, providing those masks to the community. Dan, if you go to the next slide, I'm trying to rush through this. Um, okay, there is no next slide. So, okay, there is a next slide. So what we're doing as a company is one is we mobilized and reached out to all of our employees and um, well, first is there are communities around the country, as most of you I'm sure know, who started making masks, create a volunteer effort where people make masks at home and they distribute them to communities in need in their local areas. And we first came across an organization like that called Mask Warriors. It was featured on a Today Show and we donating sheets for them to make masks. We were very inspired by their teamwork and how people came together. We then came across another organization that actually reached out to Bed Bath & Beyond asking for sheet donation. They were doing a similar thing and we donated product to them. Uh, and we thought, well, how can we replicate this effort on the bigger scale? And one is we organizing this within our own company and that's the, the step number one that we're doing or, or one of the solutions is that we are encouraging all of our people, all of our employees to make masks at home. We provided a pattern and we offer sheets they can use to make masks and then we are helping with the distribution of these masks. We're also reaching out to all of our customers and asking them how we can help um, and also encouraging perhaps them to do the same in their local communities. And this way, it not only can be done within an organization, but we're encouraging people to invite their friends and family, people in the area to help. So we can really make this initiative bigger than just us. And so both of these is part of number step number one, which is mobilizing teams within our company and within all of our customers and their communities so that we can all make mask in, masks and distribute them in the area. Step two is we have a sewing facility in Miami where we have been making alterations to product and selling them. So we have repurposed that facility and we now make masks and we donate them to groups in need. So we say, if uh, an organization needs masks, they can reach out to us um, and perhaps we can make a donation. Uh, the third solution is we are donating sheets that people can use to make masks. So if you are a community that wants to make masks, we can donate you the product we have in stock. And so that, uh, solution number four is we donating actual product to hotspot healthcare facilities or different organizations, which is uh, donated 40,000 soaps to uh, clean.org. We donated uh, sheets to, um, um, we, we are donating to Salvation Army that's in process, almost completed. So these are four solutions we offer. Uh, and then if you go to the next slide, I guess the biggest offer is 
if you would like to start an initiative like this in your company, these are the steps for you. You can drive teamwork within your organization, you can help fight COVID-19, and you can celebrate and acknowledge your people. So these are the benefits of doing something like this. And step number one, you identify the roles. We spelled it out that you need mask makers and mask distributors. Step number two, you use our instructions how to make a mask. We have a pattern and detailed instructions. And step three, we want all the celebration to come together so that as a community, we can be bigger than just an individual effort of one company or one individual. So these are three easy steps where you can get started. Um, everybody on this call, we welcome you to participate. If you're interested in any of the four things we're offering, if you want to start this in your company, we'd be happy to speak with you. If you need a donation, we can discuss that as well. But we're a local business and um, we, we, we local, but we are national business, um, and we hope to make a difference in the world and in, involve our employees, involve our customers, and create a story, change a narrative, and do something good for the community. We have a separate website if you want to learn more, hospitalityheroes.tyharvard.com. We also have a Facebook page, and we post on LinkedIn updates about what we're doing. Thank you so much, Vera and Nancy Samet, both uh, alumnus of the program, and also uh, that information of how to volunteer uh, and get more information will be in the follow-up email, uh, as well as uh, go to that website and you can, you know, there's a button where you can volunteer. You know, I'm so grateful to the community for coming together and uh, offering themselves, whether it's uh, Rosemary, who gave a beautiful and heartfelt and um, spiritual presentation today, uh, to uh, Vera, what you and Nancy are doing with TY Linen and, and, and you, you know, repurposing uh, in sheet inventory to create face, face masks that I can wear so that, my, uh, so that I'm not using the, ma the, the medical grade masks that our medical professionals need. Um, it, it's, it, everyone can do something and I love how you guys have uh, defined that. So um, I'm gonna be uh, helping tomorrow on a free webinar with the South Florida Integrated Marketing Association on how to pivot your career during a crisis. Uh, I would invite you all to attend. Um, we're gonna have four different executive recruiters uh, and then we're gonna do uh, a panel discussion with small workshops. Um, so that is uh, also in the email follow-up and that's the link. Um, next, uh, we're also on Tuesday with PRSA doing a um, webinar for launching a successful Facebook ad. Uh, there's a fee for that. Uh, that money is being donated to their scholarship fund. None of that goes to any of us, uh, but it does have a, a, a fee attached, and it's specifically for PR and communications professionals. Next Wednesday at this time, Alex de Carvalho, uh, the amazing uh, lead instructor at BizHack, uh, is going to be talking about the small business marketing playbook. Um, that's actually going to be a little bit of a precursor uh, to the big announcement that I've been saving to the end. Um, so I'll tell you about that in a second. We also have brand love essentials in two weeks and social media video ad tips and tricks in three. You probably have noticed that I've been inviting folks to um, uh, send a business climate survey and I'm here to tell you that we are listening to you. Um, what we're hearing is questions and needs around how to have resilience for once we're back to normal, whatever the heck that means. Uh, Ernie, uh, my good friend from Sapero Dental Center, uh, Eye Care Center, said, uh, "When we get out, are we going to be in a? We're going to be in a major economic depression, and how do we address thriving despite a down economy? In other words, let's not just think about survival now. Let's think about survival next. And getting your head around next steps when you feel flat-footed right now, you need." Uh, help. That's not something you can do on your own. You need mentors, you need coaching, you need great information. And this webinar series is there to help and BizHack is here to help with that. And David, uh, David Perry Associates said, how can I connect with clients that I know right now need my services? This is particularly frustrating if you don't have a sophisticated digital marketing outreach effort uh, because you don't know how to communicate even though you know there's a big need for what you do. Overall, I asked everybody, what do you need right now? Do you need about how to figure out digital marketing or do you need to figure out how to pivot your business? And literally everybody said, how do I pivot my business and career in response to all this? And so in response to your need, we've developed two offers. Um, the first is we are taking our signature 12 week program and we're crunching it down into a five week accelerated course. 
It's going to be talking about digital marketing foundations, how to get started if you're not started, and how to take it to the next level if you have. It's specifically for business owners and prof professionals, mid-career, no entry-level folks. We're going to hit social media, search, email, and lots of foundational issues like the customer journey and audience targeting. It starts in a little bit over two weeks on May 5th. We meet Tuesdays and Thursdays from 3 to 5 p.m. You'll work on a real-life campaign, and it'll include small groups and one-on-one -on -one coaching. Now, what we're also hearing is that people need community. They need to understand how to problem-solve, not necessarily information. And so we're going to be starting industry-based mastermind groups led by certified BizHack instructors. Um, we're going to group you based on matching people of the same level and facing similar issues as you. Uh, the one requirement here is we're going to launch these requiring that you're a graduate of one of our multi-week programs. We do this not just to be, not to be exclusive, but because we want to be able to assume a certain level of information and sophistication in the people who are doing this. If you're really interested in the mastermind groups and haven't been through one of our programs, I'm definitely open to having a conversation with you. But really, we want to make sure that people are at the same level and can help each other. So I want to just close by saying thank you so much to Rosemary. Thanks to Lilia Posos for helping make these happen behind the scenes. You've been amazing to work with on these. And thank you to everybody and our upcoming and past speakers. Uh, be well, be safe, stay sane, and we'll see you at this time next week. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, and keep an eye out in your email. All these resources are going to be compiled there. Um, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about those offers, uh, we'll have a link to that as well, uh, plus tons of other resources. Uh, Vera and, uh, um, and Nancy will have information about how to get involved with Hospitality Heroes, how to get involved in the free SEO, uh, and tons of other resources from there. Really appreciate you. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this. Um, wish you the absolute best. Uh, if, if you haven't yet, um, you can find us on, on Facebook and social media where you can keep a track of all of our upcoming events.